So let's get started. Um, welcome, everyone. Um, good evening, good afternoon, good morning, wherever you are in the world. And welcome to this webinar with Servier and Biomedics on our open call for application on new strategies to target autoreactive plasma cells. My name is Rita Freischlad. I am the Biomedics Event Manager, and I am based at the Biomedics Institute in Heidelberg, Germany which is cold today, but not quite this cold <laughs> yet. Mm -hmm. um, on the panel today, we have Christian Tidona, who is also from Biomedics, as well as Jean Aline and Julien Verdier from Servier. Uh, so why don't we do a quick round of introductions? Um, Christian, would you like to go first? Thank you, Rita. Hi, everyone. My name is Christian Tidona. I'm the founder and managing director of the Biomedics Institute in Heidelberg. My picture is a little warmer. <laughs> Hello, my name is Annaline. I'm leading the immunoinflammation research team at Servier. I'm based in Paris, if you can see it, in France. And uh, nice to meet you all. Thank you, Jean. Uh, Julien? Hello. You froze. <laughs> I think we lost Julien again. Oh, no. I can introduce Julien. So Julien uh, is part of our team in research, uh, also based in Paris, in Serbia. Great. Thank you very much. Hopefully he will, he will reappear soon. <laughs> um, so before we begin, uh, just a, a few words of housekeeping. Um, so if you look at the toolbar in your Zoom window, you will see a box that says Q&A on it. We ask that you enter all of your questions using the Q&A box and not the chat. Uh, this is because then you can like and comment and upvote each other's oh, questions that you find interesting. Oh. <laughs> um, you can type your questions in throughout the talks and we will get to them once we get to the Q&A portion of the webinar. And I will also be posting some links in the chat. Um, so keep your eye out for those, including the link to the call. And finally, we are recording this webinar. So tomorrow at this time, uh, I will send a link to everyone to the talk, uh, to the webinar so that you can rewatch it uh, as you're submitting your application and share it with friends uh, who might also be interested in applying. And after the webinar, if you have any further questions on the application process or anything else about the call, you can email our fabulous recruiting and communications officer, Bianca. Um, and with that, Christian, would you please uh, please share your screen and start? Yep, I will do. Uh, I think Ju Julien is back. Uh, Julien, oh. <laughs> just so yeah, sorry done, for that. Done, uh, told everyone a couple of words about it. No, sorry for that. Uh, the, so I just connected with uh, the uh, with my phone in case the the Wi-Fi was uh, the, was the problem here. Uh, so my name is Julien Verdier. I'm very happy to to be here um, uh, today with all of you. Um, I'm a PhD in uh, in immunology. Uh, we have one slide with uh, with some some background and a couple of details, uh, so we can go through this uh, later on if you want. Excellent. Thank you, Julien. Now I'll try to share my screen, and then we we get started. Okay. Good. Um, of course, the topic of our webinar today is our new call for application together with uh, with Servier. And it's about new strategies to target autoreactive plasma cells, as uh, Rita told you already. But before, uh, I'll just give you a, couple, a little bit of background about myself. Uh, I, already, I always had two hearts in my chest, one of a scientist and one of an entrepreneur. Uh, I did my PhD in virology in Heidelberg a um, long time back in the late 90s. And then during my PhD, started my first company uh, called Multimetrics and Diagnostics. Uh, then uh, joined the second one, Cytonet, a cell therapy company, which went up to phase three clinical trials. Then I started a stem cell institute called HiSTEM, Heidelberg Institute for Stem Cell Technology and Experimental Medicine, together with Andreas Trump uh, uh, in Heidelberg. And, um, and then in 2009, uh, I switched to the other side and um, became the head of the biotechnology region in Heidelberg managing an 80 million euro uh, public private research and development fund called Spitzencluster. Before in 2013, I started my own institute called Biomedics and that's the subject of, uh, of part of today's webinar. Um, but all of that, especially at Biomedics, I do because of my passion, which is 
uh, helping research talents to grow. Um, and how we do this, I'm going to explain in the next few slides. So in 2013, uh, we started the Biomedics, uh, the Biomedics Institute as a biomedical research institute on the campus of the University of Heidelberg. It's embedded in this campus, and also we have uh, a second site this year uh, opened uh, at the campus of Yale University in, um, uh, in New Haven, Connecticut. We're combining the best of the two worlds, academia and industry, and we do this via a new crowdsourcing, a new model, which is based on global crowdsourcing and local incubation of the best talents and ideas. And we actually published this uh, model in Nature Biotech in 2015. The way it works is that as soon as we have identified very big challenges, future challenges of the pharma industry, we publish those challenges worldwide at the best universities and research institutions and invite early career academic researchers to apply by submitting a very original project proposal, how to solve this particular challenge. And usually we get between 200 and 300 applications from up to 80 different countries. Then together with our partners uh, at uh, the uh, pharma company we collaborate with, we select the 15 best ones, uh, the brightest individuals and uh, fly them in for a five day boot camp where they see each other for the first time uh, and associate in, uh, in, se in several groups. And then we help them to, co to convert this collection of uh, ideas into something we would call a truly brilliant project proposal, which is presented on the last day in front of the jury. And then the winner uh, is then uh, receives then um, uh, an invitation to join biomedics, in, in this case in Heidelberg, and uh, together with um, uh, a research grant, uh, and um, we help people to relocate to Heidelberg, we organize visa, jobs for their spouses, kindergarten spots, new homes, whatever they need. And then they live and work for up to five years in our institute on the campus of the University of Heidelberg. This is what such a boot camp looks like. This is one of our last boot camps. Uh, this was in summer together with Merck on uh, the topic of new strategies to enhance the immun immunogenicity of tumors. So you see it's a very, um, there's a lot of energy and a lot of positive attitude and creativity at those boot camps. But what's very important at biomedics uh, is our core values. And we have three core values, which if you come and visit in Heidelberg, um, you will see that you see them in every other room at the wall. And, and this is because they're very important to us. The first one is cross leverage. We inspire and motivate each other to unleash our full potential. What does it mean? Biomedics is a place for people who have embraced the concept of growing by helping others. Uh, so it's not a place, uh, not a toxic environment where people don't share ideas and people work against each other. It's a place where everybody helps each other. And this is also what we're finding out during the boot camp. Uh, about the people who are joining. Cross-pollinate, we embrace diversity as it is the source of innovation. Also, when you visit, you will find out that uh, our scientists, our support team, everyone is uh, a little crazy, is a different, um, comes from all kinds of backgrounds, nationalities, genders, religions, and it's good like that because diversity is very important for innovation. From the more different perspectives people look upon the same problem, the higher, the higher the probability that innovation will happen. And this is very important for us, obviously. And the third one is aim high. Our goal is to enable a new generation of targeted therapies. So this is um, a place where people can really live up to the highest potential. And then um, at the end of a career, uh, of, a, of, of a term at biomedics, really decide whether they want to continue their career in academia or in industry. And we're going to support them wherever they want to go. Little statistics, we've been working since 10 years, we've been working with 10 different pharmaceutical companies. Uh, so here is our last partner. Together with these partners, we have started 22 projects in Heidelberg. Uh, two, of, uh, two projects have already been started in New Haven, close to Yale University at our new site. Um, we also we are involved as a strategic partner in uh, a venture studio called Ion Labs in Rehovot in Israel. Uh, where we use the very same model to start companies, to create startups in the field of artificial intelligence for drug discovery and development. We also publish. We have more than 50 publications in peer-reviewed journals. This is very important for us uh, to allow our fellows at the end of their term at Biomedics to go back to an academic career if they want to. 
And we're also educating. Uh, we have uh, completed more than 60 bachelor, master, and PhD thesis, uh, thesis. And our focus at our different sites is a combination of deep disease biology and artificial intelligence. To dig a little deeper, uh, almost all of our teams are working with primary human materials, uh, samples. Some of them receive whole organs, like whole intestines, or whole brains, uh, or whole lungs, uh, to generate very complex human organotypic disease models and really look uh, in a new way uh, onto disease uh, at its full complexity. And of course, these teams are generating very deep uh, single cell data sets, multi dimensional biological data sets. So uh, almost all the teams have dedicated bioinformaticians or data scientists that make sense out of those data. Some of the teams are uh, full-fledged AI, ML teams. Um, and also we have teams that develop biosensors. We had one team that developed, for example, a diagnostic biosensor. Uh, and currently, uh, for example, we have one team that is developing a new sensor uh, that allows you to measure pharmacology in the brain of a freely moving mouse. Uh, and you have to imagine that all these teams work together and we encourage them to collaborate, uh, to cross leverage and cross pollinate, as I mentioned in our core values. Now, this doesn't happen in a void. In Heidelberg, this on the left side, you see a map with about um, a two hour, one and a half hours drive radius around Heidelberg. And you can see that this is a very dense geographic area with lots of uh, small companies, large pharmaceutical companies, and also universities and research institutions. And the centerpiece is the campus in Neuenheimerfeld. Um, it's uh, technically it's a square mile uh, with more than 100 institutes in uh, biotech and life sciences, uh, 22,000 jobs plus 16,000 students in this field. And we're in the technology park uh, on this campus right in the middle uh, and within walking distance of all these um, uh, academic facilities. And there currently we operate close to 2,000 square meters of open innovation lab and office sharing community, uh, fully equipped labs, and uh, for large instruments, uh, we have collaborations with neighboring academic institutes so that we can use their core facilities. Uh, some of these are uh, the European Molecular Biology Laboratory uh, in Heidelberg, uh, University of Heidelberg uh, and University Hospital with its facilities, the German Cancer Research Center, and so far, we have established more than 60 collaborations with academic institutes worldwide. So it's very easy to get access to academic resources uh, and collaborate with academic partners. Um, Biomedics worldwide so far, apart from Heidelberg, as I mentioned, we have um, uh, an incubator uh, called Vent a Venture Studio called Ion Labs, where we generate startups. We have a site at Yale University in New Haven, Connecticut, and we have a new model called Exceed Labs, which is on the campus of Burien Ingelheim uh, in Richfield, Connecticut, close to our Yale uh, facility. Now, our activities, if you, if you are interested in joining, our activities are very broad because for us, it's very important that everyone at Biomedics is creative, productive, and gets everything they need to be happy and, and creative. Uh, on one level, we are, there's lots of things where we foster engagement across all the teams. There is the so-called explore events, uh, where you can learn about new technologies or career development. Uh, we have a green team that is looking at uh, sustainability of our laboratory and improving our CO2 footprint. Um, there is, of course, a lot of science at the Friday meetings. Every Friday, the group leaders decide who presents uh, his or her work in front of everyone, and then everyone comments and helps and contributes. We have an annual science retreat where for two days uh, we go to an off-site uh, and uh, and just enjoy science together. There's a lot of education, um, which is optional. Uh, I'm, for example, together with two friends, uh, I'm running the Scientist Entrepreneur course, where you can learn how to turn uh, a scientific publication into a pitch deck for a startup. Uh, you can also learn about scientific writing, or you can learn German, but you don't have to in Heidelberg because it's a very international place. Everybody speaks, speaks English. Cam uh, on campus, we are jointly with the um, with the po postdoc association of the Cancer Research Center, we are organizing lunch talks where we invite once a month a top speaker from around the world and then invite the entire campus to uh, discuss science with us. There's lots, of, uh, there's lots of joint sports activities from dragon boat racing to uh, charity runs and uh, also a lot of social activities, uh, potluck, for example, where everyone brings food from their home countries. We have at the moment uh, more than 25 nationalities at Biomedics. 
Uh, then once a month, there's a beer hour organized by one of the lab teams. Uh, we have an annual summer party and the year-end cooking event. Uh, so lots of uh, ways how you can mix and mingle with like-minded, like brilliant individuals. This is what it looks like at our retreat or the dragon boat race. Last time we were the Smurfs. It's always fun to uh, also uh, spend time together outside of the lab. Value proposition for talents. First and foremost, uh, it's a fully funded three to five year research group with very generous funding. Um, we focus on outstanding research and publications, so no teaching obligations. Uh, it's a creative cross-cultural teamwork atmosphere with guidance from experienced mentors from academia and industry. It's an outstanding environment with direct access to leading research institutions and companies. And uh, the ones who are interested in leadership and entrepreneurship training, this is also something we offer. And first and, first and foremost, it's um, a risk-free assessment of a possible future career in a startup or big company, because since we publish, we can always go back to academia because you have a continuous publication record. Uh, can we attract top talent from around the world? I think uh, after um, 10 years and more than 300 employment agreements, I can say, yes, we can. This is just the logos of some former institutes of our biomedics researchers, where they came from. It's from all the top institutions worldwide. Where do they go afterwards? About 50% go to industry, and we help uh, in doing this. And about 50% go back to academia. Some of them are professors or department heads uh, at universities. And um, with it, with uh, with that, this is uh, this is my final slide. Just uh, pointing you to the place where you can register if you're interested in joining any of our locations in Germany, in Israel, or in the United States at career.bio.mx. And of course, we encourage you to follow us either personally or our institute on LinkedIn to be up, up to date to all the latest information. And with that, I give back to Rita. Thank you very much, Christian. Um, and to all of the attendees, again, you can feel free to start typing your questions in the Q&A box. Um, ask all about what it's like at Biomedics or Heidelberg or what the boot camp will look like. And uh, now we're going to hear from Jean and Julien about the scientific element of the call. So Jean, if you please. Yes, thank you, Rita. Um, let me share my screen, sorry. Okay. So again, welcome everybody and thank you for joining us tonight or today, wherever you are. <laughs> uh, so again, my name is Jeanne. Um, I'm currently the head of immunoinflammation research at Servier. Uh, I actually initially started my training in human genetics in Paris, France, uh, which led me to a PhD in the epigenetics of B-cell lymphoma at the Institut Gustave Roussy, also in France. Uh, from there, uh, I pursued with a postdoc at the NYU School of Medicine in New York, uh, looking at epigenetics of the B and T cells development. Uh, that's where I, I kept playing with immune cells, let's say, uh, and lymphocytes. Uh, and from there, I joined uh, Regeneron Pharmaceuticals, also in the New York area in the US, where I joined the immunoinflammation research team. And I was uh, leading various programs, mostly in the field of allergy and barrier tissue immunity, so mostly the lung and the skin, uh, all monoclonal antibody programs, some of them currently in the clinic or on the market. Uh, and after about eight years, I on, uh, I moved back to France. This was in 2019, where I joined Servier. And I'm currently um, leading the autoimmunity portfolio and a team of uh, PhD level scientists. And we're based in Saclay. I will talk more about that uh, in a few slides. Um, Julien, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Uh, thank you, Jeanne. Uh, so my name is Julien Verdier. Uh, I'm a so-called disease biology expert uh, in immunoinflammation in, uh, in the group of, uh, of Jeanne at Servier. Um, I did a PhD in immunology in the Necker Institute. It, it, it was a uh, next to a hospital for sick children, and I was working on uh, inflammatory bowel diseases. Then I moved uh, to Germany, actually, in Aachen, uh, where I was working in a European consortium, applying a systems biology approach uh, for inflammatory bowel diseases. I loved the, um, the interdisciplinary uh, approach. Sorry about uh, that. Um, maybe we can come back to Julien. Uh, oh. 
it doesn't work. So I will give you a brief introduction of Servier, uh, the company, and what we do, and then Julien will give you more details about the proposal. Maybe we can get back to Julien's introduction then. Okay. So, um, yes, I will tell you a few words about our um, company so that you know who you would be working with and how we could partner together. Uh, so, Serge is an independent pharmaceutical company. Uh, what's peculiar about Serge is that it's governed by a nonprofit foundation. Uh, it is the second largest pharmaceutical group in, uh, in France and the 34th in the world. Um, there are currently over 20,000 employees worldwide and close to 3,000 in R&D specifically. Uh, the revenue is close to 5 billion a year, but what's important to note and, and above average in the industry is that over 20% of that revenue is directly reinvested in R&D every year. So that gives us a significant budget for research. Uh, and there are currently 30, more than 30 approved drugs uh, from Servier in cardiometabolism, oncology, and neurosciences. Um, so again, yeah, Servier is governed by a nonprofit foundation uh, that gives us independence. Uh, we don't have shareholders, so we can uh, have freedom on the choice that we think are best for patients. And it also allows us to have a longer term vision as we're not as much subjected to uh, market movements, let's say. Um, and this has been the case from the foundation of Servier. We are committed to working with patients, uh, and this is not just on paper. Uh, really, if you talk to anybody in a research organization, you will see that it's, it's the core vocation. This is why we go to work every day. Uh, Servier has established collaborations with close to 30 patient organizations worldwide. And really what we, what we do is we try and incorporate the patient vision at every step of a drug cycle uh, life. Uh, really as early as we can, we try to understand the patient needs so that we can really design the best drug to address those needs. Currently in research, uh, there are four therapeutic areas, we call them at Servier, so four different research areas, uh, oncology being the largest in the number of people in the number of projects. Then we have immunoinflammation, and we'll talk more about this one today, uh, neuroscience and cardiometabolism. Uh, you can see the number, uh, the breakdown of the number of projects on that slide. Currently in immunoinflammation, we have two programs in preclinical research, so reaching clinical stages soon, and nine programs that are earlier um, in the research phase. So recently, in the last spring, actually, we moved to a brand new campus. So the R&D uh, of Servier France moved to Saclay, to the building you can see on this slide. Uh, it's really a, an amazing space. I really hope you can come and visit one day. Uh, but before that, the different French R&D sites of Servier were scattered in different locations. And what's uh, really um, amazing for us in our daily job is that this new building has really brought us together. It's not just a metaphor. <laughs> it's physically brought us together, which allows us to collaborate more closely, brainstorm, exchange technologies and ideas more easily. Um, it's also located in Saclay, which you may not know, but is a, is a large hub in France for science and technologies. We're neighbors to some of the largest universities and schools in France, uh, close to other biotechs, other companies. And what's important to note also is that our building, the Servier building, is hosting a startup incubator um, with 110 uh, people capacity that is starting to fill up. That also is, is nice for us because it gives us some uh, access to, uh, again, new thinking, new innovative technologies and exchanges. So it's a very open environment and, and, and very rich uh, scientifically. This center in Saclay um, is connected to our other R&D centers worldwide at Servier uh, that you can see on this map. We have a research center in Boston that opened last July, um, a year and a half ago. Uh, then we have a fairly large center in Denmark also focused on biologics. Uh, we also have a center in China focused more on clinical research and a large historical center in, um, in Hungary, in Budapest for chemistry. And we really work closely together, uh, depending on the topics. Everybody has their own expertise, but it's also giving us this um, uh, yeah, access to maybe more local research and cultural exchanges. It's, it's very rich 
and very um, nice. <laughs> Of course, we know that um, science uh, doesn't uh, progress on its own. We're close to 3,000 in R&D at Servier, but um, we know the more the merrier as it comes to scientific challenges. So we have established partnerships with over 30 companies worldwide that you can see on this slide for various programs, whether it's access to technology or um, scientific exchanges or partnering of assets. Um, and also we have a really rich network of academic collaborations. Again, we think uh, this is really important for access to the latest breakthrough science, but also to some uh, specific technologies. <clears throat> Service is also engaged for diversity. Um, Service is actually a company uh, where the majority of employees are women, uh, close to 60%, and about half of the managers of the different groups within uh, Service are women. And the goal for next year is to have 40% of women in leadership positions. Um, I won't go through the details, but Servi has various initiatives to try and promote diversity in all its forms, not just gender, um, that uh, are very active uh, in different forms and around the globe. Uh, we also have different HR certifications. Uh, again, I won't go through the details, but what um, you should know is that it's really, again, a, um, a very a pool of very engaged people. Uh, people really come to this job, as you may have in your career, uh, with a commitment to try and help patient lives. And that reflects in those HR scores that can be discussed. But this is really something that we can see every day when we go to work. Um, and the last number I want to mention is that close to 80% of the employees of service say they would recommend this group as a great place to work. And service also engaged for the planet. Um, again, this is not just uh, on paper. <laughs> this is concrete actions. Again, I can't list all of them, but the, the goal, the commitment is to reduce our footprint, carbon footprint by a quarter, by 20%, by 2030. And this is really all the way um, from the design of the new building to the ink in the drug boxes to, again, all the steps of the chemistry of our drugs, transports, everything. Um, some points are listed already, some achievements that are um, already completed, but there's many more initiatives ongoing. And so is also part of um, several biodiversity um, initiatives that are also listed on the slide. And so if we go into a bit more details about what we do for um, in immune inflammation at Servier, I just wanted to give you a few more points, but Julien will go uh, in more details in the, when he explains to you the, the proposal. But so at Servier, in immune inflammation, we're really focused on the treatment of autoimmune disorders. Um, just to give you a little background, uh, immune inflammation at Servier is fairly new. Uh, the group was uh, founded in 2016, so in, uh, in research and in R&D that's, uh, that's recent. <laughs> uh, the group started on the foundation of the rheumatology group, actually, and it started with different partnerships and acquisitions of assets. So in the early days, there were three projects that were all coming from external research, but that has evolved since then, as you can see on the slide. Uh, main step was in 2020, uh, we merged with the neurosciences group to form what, what we call the growth seed. So it's like a, a biotech, the innovative group within Servier, let's say, uh, with access to new technologies, uh, uh, smaller groups, so different ways of working, and that's really um, very rich and, and very dynamic. Uh, we hired people coming from different uh, places in the world and different backgrounds. Um, and that's, um, again, very stimulating. Uh, also, what happened in 2020 that was really important for the immunology group was the acquisition of Symphogen, which is a Danish company that had its own uh, proprietary technology and platform for generating and screening monoclonal antibodies. So for us in immunology, that gave us access to a whole platform and portfolio of monoclonal antibodies that you may know are very um, uh, pivotal now for the treatment of autoimmunity. Um, and now, more recently, we're moving more into the rare disease space. Um, and that's something we can elaborate on if you have questions. And so today we have 11 internal projects. Um, that's something I have to say I'm, I'm really proud of from, from the team. Again, that's a young team. And going from uh, 0 to 11 in, in just a few years is quite exceptional. Uh, for this, we relied on the internal expertise that was already at Servier, at Symphogen, and again, also on the new hires uh, that um, 
came in the last few years. Uh, for those projects, we use three different uh, therapeutic modalities. Uh, in the immunology group, it's the vast majority of our programs use uh, biologics, so mostly monoclonal antibodies. Uh, but we also have access to small molecules, which, which is the core expertise of Servier, and more recently to azos or antisense um, oligonucleotides. In immunoinflammation, we have developed specific partnerships that are listed on this slide. So we're part of several networks, <clears throat> and we have collaborations with hospitals and universities for specific uh, diseases of interest. I want to mention one network in particular, which is the Marseille Immunology Biocluster. This is a new um, government-funded um, cluster composed of biotechs, universities, hospitals, all grouped together to tackle questions related to immunology. Uh, the funding is really large and, uh, and the network is amazing. Um, and so is a founding member of this biocluster. So again, that gives us access to uh, brainstorming uh, key people in immunology that you may have heard the names of, uh, potentially new technologies and, and, and new targets. Uh, Servi is also committed to publishing uh, because we know this is crucial for the, the scientific community to spread um, knowledge and, and scientific evidence. Um, also because we know it's important for our collaborators and also because we have a significant number of uh, PhD students and postdocs uh, within Servier and we know it's also important for them and their career to publish. So you can see a snapshot of some recent publications uh, from the immunoinflammation group on this slide. And then finally, I wanted to start and go more into um, explaining a bit our scientific strategy within the group uh, before Julien tells you more about the, the question for today. Uh, but so as you may know, um, given your background, you know that immunity is very broad, very complex, and we know that there are multiple mechanisms at play in autoimmunity. Uh, so the approach that we took is to try and um, target specific pathways um, again, not going into too much details, but in being pretty simplistic, but for the sake of time, uh, we um, generally say that there are main lesional mechanisms involved in autoimmunity. By that, we mean main pathways that are leading to organ damage and organ dysfunction that are listed here. So some um, are more mediated by antibodies, uh, some are more inflammatory and some more cytotoxic with cytotoxic cells directly um, dis, um, degrading the tissue cells. Um, and, and we know that in some autoimmune diseases, several or all of those mechanisms can be involved. This is what we call the complex autoimmune diseases. In those indications, in those diseases, we know it's going to be more challenging for us to check whether the drugs that we develop, our assets, are efficacious or not, because the, the signal of efficacy, if we hit a pathway, may be um, blurred in the background of the other dysregulations in that disease. So our approach was to um, focus on, on, on specific immunological pathways. Um, number one, to increase our expertise, <laughs> uh, increase our knowledge around that pathway, develop specific assets, share those assets between different programs, create synergies. And then we tried and identify diseases in which those pathways are known to be the main driver, those specific pathways. We moved away from the more complex autoimmune diseases to try and focus on the ones that are um, dominantly drive, uh, driven by these pathways. In our case, we chose to focus on the antibody-mediated diseases, where we know that the mere presence of autoantibodies is directly linked to the clinical symptoms. And we um, uh, identified different targets, therapeutic targets in this pathway. Um, this took us quite some time, a number of months, <laughs> to match the targets and the indications, but we think we have really strong leads and, and a very strong scientific rationale uh, to tackle some of those diseases. And so, again, we know it's not going to take, uh, we know the immunity is very complex. We know a single approach is probably not going to be sufficient. Uh, we know we need innovation. We know patient 
uh, have very limited options today in terms of therapeutic options. Uh, that's also for us uh, a push to try new things and to try and be really innovative. That's why we're here today. Uh, so we asked that question, we discussed with Christian. Uh, we had many um, discussions around the biomedics model. We thought it was perfect to tackle such a complex question. Uh, and so Julien, if I hope you're back, Julien. <laughs> if Julien is back, Julien will tell you more about the, the proposal for today. Yeah, I hope you can hear me correctly. Um, can you hear me? Back here. Yeah. Can you hear me? I think you're muted. Perfectly, yeah. perfectly well. Okay. Um, well, if if it doesn't work because uh, there there seems to be some you. connection problems, uh, you you don't you cannot hear me. No. Uh, yeah. We can, yes. can we can hear you, but your slides are not shown anymore. Yeah, sure, sure, okay. So I'll try to 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 show the slides. If it doesn't work, uh, don't hesitate to 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 shout out. <laughs> and um, right, look like this. Um, okay. So the 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 call for today uh, is about uh, developing new strategies. I don't know about others, but I can't hear you. Is it? Uh, I can. Oh, no, I can oh, sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I was disrupting everybody. <laughs> sorry, no Julia. Go no ahead. Problem. No problem at all. It's just Julia. Your your slides are not shown at the moment. Oh, you need to share them again. Uh, no, no. You're right. Okay, sorry. For sure. No problem. That's the fun part. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. No. It Perfect. Coming. Yep. Is it working? Okay. Um, so the call is about new strategies to um, to target uh, autoreactive plasma cells, and we'll see a bit more uh, in details uh, what it's all about. Uh, so first, two words about uh, about autoimmunity. Autoimmunity overall, it's more than a hundred uh, diseases that collectively affect uh, about ten percent uh, of the population if we take uh, them uh, all of them together. And, and current treatments uh, are usually not cur curative uh, and they have significant side effects, mostly because they try to, uh, to dampen the immune system and we need the proper uh, immune system to, to, to protect us. And if we don't care about, uh, about autoimmunity or about uh, patients, we can care about the costs uh, it, it represents. And it's uh, quite substantial because uh, people don't show to work, people have to go to the hospital, and it's, uh, it's uh, estimated to, buy, to be about uh, $100 billion uh, uh, per, per year. Um, so in, in uh, autoimmune diseases that are uh, driven by uh, Bioantibodies. Uh, uh, we'll see a bit uh, what happens. But first, uh, in a, in a normal situation, you know that we have uh, different uh, B cells with different specificities. So we have like blue B cells or red uh, B cells, and uh, their specificities is defined by what they can recognize. And this is uh, defined by the uh, expression at the cell surface of, of uh, antibodies. So the blue antibodies recognize a blue antigen, the red antibody recognize a red uh, uh, antigen. And uh, normally B cells uh, are activated if needed and they obtain series of authorizations uh, that grant them the possibility to become antibody secreting cells uh, that are also called uh, plasma cells. And this is, in a nutshell, the goal of uh, vaccination. We want to force a B cell to become an antibody uh, secreting cells. Um, and uh, for this, you need a series of authorizations. It's very tightly controlled uh, because the process of producing uh, secreting antibodies is very costly in terms of energy. And these cells are really antibody factories. They uh, secrete about 1,000 antibodies per second every hour, every day, every week, sometimes for years. Uh, so it's, it's quite uh, effective. And in autoimmunity, uh, some autoreactive uh, cells are abnormally activated and they are authorized somehow to become antibody secreting cells that uh, produce, that secrete um, autoantibodies. 
Uh, somehow this could be considered as an auto-vaccination uh, if you want. And one way to uh, treat these patients would be to devaccinate them. Uh, one thing is uh, we could think that uh, we could try to prevent B cells from becoming uh, antibody secreting cells in these patients. But usually when they uh, present at the hospital, when they have symptoms, it's already too late. They already have uh, um, antibody secreting cells uh, that produce autoantibodies. And one thing that uh, I would like here uh, to stress is that while on the left-hand side of the, of the slide, we could see that there are uh, distinct B cell populations that could be distinguished by the type of uh, antibody they express at the cell surface. While when they become antibody secreting cells, uh, there is nothing that that can uh, distinguish uh, them. The only thing that they do, which is different, is they produce different uh, 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 antibodies with different uh, uh, specificities. But there is not like a cell surface marker that can say that one cell is an autoreactive uh, plasma cell while another one is not. Um, and, and there are several uh, uh, treatments uh, that aim at uh, targeting uh, B cells uh, in autoimmunity, not only, but, but notably in, uh, in autoimmunity, and uh, also some treatments uh, that aim at target the authorization uh, uh, processes, typically the ones that uh, take place into uh, germinal centers with the help of, of, of T cells. Uh, but there is really one uh, uh, therapeutic area that is still locked, uh, for which there is no treatment, and which is to try to get rid of autoreactive uh, plasma cells. Uh, and what's uh, important to note here is that uh, the treatments uh, uh, that try to eliminate uh, a B cell? So on the on the left uh, hand side of the of the slide, they usually get rid of all B cells. So it could work; it could dampen the symptoms sometimes in uh, in uh, in autoimmunity. Uh, but when you do this, you also get rid of some protective B cells, and and you uh, dampen the, the 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 amount of protective uh, antibodies. So it's not possible to uh, to propose this treatment for a long uh, term uh, in patients. And uh, what we would like to do with you and with biomedics is to open uh, the therapeutic uh, area indicated on the right and to get rid, and this is the challenge, and this is really, really uh, something we don't know exactly how to do this, uh, and this would be to get rid, to eliminate only selectively autoreactive plasma cells and to uh, leave untouched uh, the pool of protective uh, uh, plasma cells producing uh, protective uh, antibodies. And um, there are several difficulties for this. Uh, one of them is that, as I mentioned, uh, autoreactive plasma cells, we don't know how to distinguish them from uh, protective uh, plasma cells. And another difficulty is that these plasma cells are very uh, scarce. We don't have many, many, many uh, uh, plasma cells because they are very efficient at producing uh, antibodies, thousands and thousands and thousands. Uh, uh, each each second. Uh, also, they are located in uh, tissues, uh, sometimes in the skin, sometimes in the bone marrow. Uh, we don't know exactly all the time where they are located. Uh, so this is uh, really those are two two aspects of the the difficulties that uh, that we'll have in this in this very exciting uh, uh, challenge. Um, and how to demonstrate uh, uh, this? Uh, what we would like you to do is to uh, provide with a proof of concept in an autoimmune disease called pemphigus uh, vulgaris. And why this, why this, uh, this disease? Uh, basically, you know, there are many autoimmune diseases uh, with uh, plenty of autoantibodies, uh, but we don't know exactly uh, to which extent uh, they are pathogenic or we don't understand the role of these autoantibodies. But in Pemphigus vulgaris, it's not the case. We know very, very well, we understand very, very well um, the, the, the pathogenic role of these antibodies. And basically, those are just antibodies that uh, target something that enable skin cells to, to, to get stuck together. Uh, so just because they are antibodies, 
as a result of antibodies targeting these molecules, uh, skin cells are disrupted and you have uh, the blisters that, you, that are indicated uh, uh, in this picture, for, for instance. Um, and as such, this is uh, typically uh, a disease where we know that if we uh, get rid of these autoantibodies, uh, we basically can cure the patients. And this would be unprecedented in autoimmunity. Um, also, something uh, that is uh, noteworthy is that uh, this, this area that has been uh, uh, unco uncovered uh, would be kind of linked to other projects that we already have uh, uh, um, uh, aiming at, at uh, getting rid of B cells or autoreactive B cells uh, in Penfigus vulgaris. So this biomedics uh, challenge would be linked to existing uh, projects that we are currently uh, developing in, in our pipeline. Um, so the solution, we don't really have it, uh, but uh, we know basically what we uh, do not want and what we want. Uh, so what we do not want, uh, for instance, is a device. It could be a plasma pheresis, for instance, uh, because you could think that maybe uh, you could take the whole blood of, of patients and uh, to, to, to make this blood go through a tube uh, coated with, a, with an autoantigen, and then you would trap uh, the uh, autoantibodies and you could re-inject uh, uh, the blood into the patients. And indeed, you would clean up the blood and remove the, uh, the autoantibodies. Uh, but in fact, it's not really feasible because you would still have these uh, antibody secreting cells that secrete and secrete and secrete uh, autoantibodies. So it's only a transient uh, uh, solution. We also do not want a cell therapy because there are some, some approaches like this, but it's very, very uh, complex and, and it's a difficult uh, treatment uh, uh, to apply to, to patients. Um, we would prefer not to have an MHC-based approach because of the inherent complexity uh, of these uh, uh, aspects of, of bio biology and also um, not a therapy targeting consequences of autoantibodies um, this for a simple reason, which is that in some diseases, uh, it could be strategically interesting to uh, target the consequences of autoantibodies because they could be recognized by other immune cells or things like this. It's not at all the case in Pemphigus vulgaris. Uh, we know that the symptoms are, are only due to the uh, physical presence of autoantibodies. We just have to get rid of uh, these autoantibodies and ideally uh, uh, to the, the, the source of uh, these autoantibodies. Uh, so what we want is a drug uh, that targets and specifically eliminate plasma cells producing autoantibodies and, um, and to keep the protective plasma cells producing a protective, uh, a protective uh, antibodies against uh, infectious uh, agents, viruses, etc. Um, one solution could be uh, to think about some sort of auto antigen trap, but I don't, I don't want to to say too much about this because I don't want to to bias you too much into this sole uh, solution because maybe this is not the only solution. And the drug basically could be um, any of the modalities uh, that uh, Jean mentioned. Uh, so it could be an antibody. Uh, we have uh, very skilled people uh, here to develop antibodies. It could be a naso, which is anti-sense uh, oligonucleotides. Uh, nucleotides, or it could be a, a small molecule. Um, just checking, could you still hear me? Yes, perfectly yes, well. Yes, can. Okay, cool. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so who can apply? Uh, basically, we have positions uh, for gr uh, one group leader, uh, two postdoctoral researchers, uh, two research assistants, um, we would uh, need PhD or master's degree uh, with an outstanding track uh, record or strong interest in immunology. Uh, when we're saying outstanding track record, I just want to mention that you do not necessarily have to have published in nature or science. Uh, if you did, it's great, but uh, it's, not, it's not absolutely uh, mandatory. And preferentially with experience on B cell responses because, um, because this, is a, this is a tough topic. Uh, you would need uh, strong analytical skills, uh, of course, and an ability to uh, summarize. It's very important for communication, an ability to uh, anticipate uh, difficulties, 
troubleshooting and to uh, innovate and to be interested in leading or collaborating uh, team in a cross-functional team. Uh, this is something I'm going to mention this uh, uh, afterwards, but uh, both at Biomedics and at, at Servier, uh, most of the strength, uh, we have it because it's highly uh, multidisciplinary. Uh, and this is the, the, the great uh, thing here. And problem solving, uh, of course, because we don't expect the things to, to, to work uh, immediately. Um, so what can uh, Servier offer the winning team? As uh, uh, Jeanne mentioned, uh, we have a healthy environment. I'm going to mention this uh, again in the next slide, which will be my, my last uh, uh, slide. Uh, you would have access to our R&D uh, center in Paris, uh, Saclay, with all the, the, the variety of, of uh, people. Uh, again, with a lot of uh, diversity in terms of uh, background and uh, and skills, uh, you could interact with uh, people from academic and biopharma uh, scientists uh, from different fields. Uh, you could belong to a community of PhD students and postdoc, which is it's, which is called the uh, Shine Docs, uh, which is a, a, a community. Um, that has a, a congress, a mini congress. So ha you have the same thing in in biomedics, and uh, and it's it's really a nice thing to to have, and it works very well. And uh, an access to an expertise in drug development because this is uh, this is what we do uh, at the end. And um, on my last slide, I just wanted to uh, to think about because I didn't have a chance to 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 and sorry again for the the, the problems of uh, connection, but to introduce myself. But uh, um, I spent a lot of time uh, in the academic, uh, and I only joined uh, Servi two years ago. Uh, so I remember my impressions or my the, the cliches I had on the, um, the the pharmaceutical world, and I just wanted to to mention some of them. Uh, so first, uh, first and foremost, what is the purpose of a pharmaceutical company? It's to uh, to deliver drug for patients, and all the discussions that we have with the colleagues uh, when we have lunch, when we have a coffee break, and etc. Uh, uh, it's all about this. This is really the mindset that we have. Uh, we want to provide a, a solution uh, for patients who who, who need them. Um, and and Servier also, it's not a big pharma, um, and the point is um is that uh so it's both it's both both uh, an inconvenient and an advantage uh because uh we cannot um so we cannot like like think yeah we're going to have a treatment for diabetes or for very wide uh, uh, uh diseases for instance because there are some big pharmas precisely and so we have to have some niches and to be innovative and to think a little bit differently uh, so that we can be uh, success successful here. Um, one also cliches uh, that I had, at least uh, when I was in the academic, uh, was do we have less freedom uh, in a pharmaceutical company than in a uh, academic uh, laboratory? Uh, typically, I was under the impression that uh, projects would uh, stop abruptly uh, in a pharmaceutical company based on a decision uh, uh, taken by someone above, uh, while it's not really the case in an academic laboratory where you have uh, uh, some, some projects that, that can uh, you, you can work on them for for, for a long time. Um, so paradoxically, I think it's it's not really uh, uh, the case uh, because uh, we do have a lot of uh, uh, freedom. Um, in that um, in that we can uh, uh, propose uh, solutions and discuss uh, these solutions uh, with many people. And if it if it makes sense. Uh, we can uh, we can start something that is big, which is really the development of a drug for uh, for patients. And for this, we do make research. We have laboratories, uh, we have lab coats, we read papers, uh, we have journal clubs. So everything uh, very uh, similar to 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 the uh, academic. Uh, also, we fail sometimes. Uh, so we do drugs that sometimes do not work uh, the way we thought they would work. Uh, and it's important to cope uh, with this and to be able and to learn how to uh, de-risk uh, failure 
and we we have successes uh, sometimes. And just uh, uh, one example, uh, there is a drug, so it's a, it's a drug for cancer uh, that has been tested recently uh, in patients, and the FDA, so the regulatory uh, authority in the in the US, uh, they say it to Servier, so no stop testing this drug because it's working so well that it's not ethical not to, to, to propose this drug to all the patients with this type of, of, of cancer. Uh, and it's quite, uh, quite rare. Uh, so we do have some, some successes like this uh, that are uh, significant. Uh, also, Servier, I think this year, published like three times in New England Journal of Medicine, which is one of the biggest uh, uh, journal of, uh, of uh, medicine. Uh, it's all. Uh, it's not all uh, only about profits. It's not at all something that we discuss every day uh, with our colleagues. We discuss about experiments, about uh, uh, whether it makes sense to have this type of drug or should we change it a little bit so that it works better like this uh, and to try to understand better the diseases and the patients uh, and so on. So, uh, so it's quite uh, uh, human after all. And bottom line is we're developing drugs for the patients uh, uh, who need them and we're sometimes also sitting next to a giants in, in medicine or in, in pharma. Just two examples for this. Uh, there is uh, one, one person, so we are sitting in an uh, open space, um, a guy who's a star of uh, genetics in the, the, the south of France, and he's like some sort of Indiana Jones of, of genetics. Uh, so trying to, so he's a medical doctor, so he had uh, patients uh, coming to him and he tried to understand exactly what, what was the genetic reason for their disease and trying to uh, develop uh, a solution for these patients. And now he's working uh, at Servier, uh, so it means a lot uh, about um, the, the fact that he believes that we can uh, provide some innovative solutions for, for these type of patients. And another example is um, a young girl uh, so who published well, but but that's not the point. But she, but she came here, and she uh, convinced everybody that uh, it was possible to design uh, a specific drug, and it was for one patient who had a disease. It was in neuroscience, but one patient who had a disease, and she galvanized everybody to 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 create this drug, to generate this drug um, as soon as possible. And the reason why it had to be quick. It was not for in terms of money or whatever. It was just that uh, this girl was about to die if she didn't have a treatment. Uh, so really, this is the kind of spirit <laughs> uh, that we're um, having here, on my impression, at least. Um, uh, so yeah, I think I'm done here. Um, and so you have here an idea of uh, what we look like. Uh, so you see, we're not like having suits. <laughs> And uh, and we're smiling and we're all uh, um, uh, humans. And uh, with that, uh, thank you.